Hello everyone, my name is Kurazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We were busy in our last episode, where we made a vineyard for berries, and we made a little apiary for our bees. In today's episode, we are going to make some big strides forward. I have some big plans for today, and those plans involve advancing to the Copper Age. It's been a while. We've been digging a lot with our hands and stone tools and breaking a thousand axes while chopping trees for firewood. It's time to get some tools that are more effective and more durable. Getting into the Copper Age is kind of a big deal because it gets us access to a lot of materials that we didn't have access to before. Things that we couldn't mine, for instance, well, anything. We haven't been able to mine any stones aside from surface materials, like little rocks in the ground. And there are a lot of things we can make with much larger pieces of stone, like bricks, or full stone slabs, or polished stone. We will also be getting access to things like saws and shears. Saws will let us make wooden items with planks rather than with logs or with sticks. And shears will greatly speed up the process of chopping trees down by shearing all their leaves off for sticks and seeds. But how to get into the Copper Age? Well, there are a couple ways. One, the easy way, is you can find tools in tool vessels out in ruins, and you can bootstrap yourself into the Copper Age that way. And we could have done that. I didn't want to show that because it, we didn't put in the effort to actually get to the Copper Age. So that's why these tools have been hanging here on the wall. The other way is sort of the old-fashioned way, elbow grease. Now to get into the Copper Age the old-fashioned way, we need a few things. One, we need copper. I have some here. These are nuggets of native copper. I got most of them from panning, especially when I was working on getting the last few bits of that quartz for the windows. Second, you need fire, and we have that right over here. Third, you need a crucible in which to smelt these into molten copper. And lastly, at least for now, we need to have molds in which to pour the copper. Later on, we'll be able to actually forge copper and other metals using an anvil and a hammer. But for now, the more primitive method of pouring copper into molds is how we're going to be getting our tools. And for some tools, in the Copper Age and even into the Bronze Age, using molds can actually be more efficient. Because while you can make many more things on an anvil than you can with molds, the molds don't use up hammer durability in the smithing process. So what kinds of things can we mold? Well, we can make ingot molds for making ingots, and we will want to make several of these. We can make axes, pickaxes, shovels, long blades, hammers, anvils, health hammers, which we'll get to eventually, hoes, prospecting picks, and lamellae. These are for armor. For right now, the ones that we're most interested in are the pickaxe mold and the hammer mold, and you'll see why later in this episode. However, I'm going to go ahead and make at least one of each of these molds, probably several pickaxe molds, as well as a large number of ingot molds, and fire them all at once, just so I have them all at hand. So I guess without further ado, let's get moldy. And with all these tool molds and these ingot molds ready, it's time to go fire them. And there we have it. We are firing all those molds and, well, some of the molds I had to leave about a dozen of the ingot molds up in the storage, but those are not as important right now. Now that those are firing, I think it's time to take care of a couple things I've wanted to get to in the past couple episodes. One is I spotted down here on the map a trader. I want to go see him, see what he's got for sale, and then I think it is time to come down here and see what we can find in these ruins, this little city or village or town. I think there's going to be some good stuff we can find there. So let's go do that. And of course there's a wolf down there, chasing a rabbit around. Hey buddy. Commodities trader. Oh, this is a good one. What have you got for us? So you will buy these things that we can't even collect, and some clothes. And you'll sell some tin ore, some ooh, blasting powder, metal parts. That's not too shabby. Okay, well, we'll keep you in mind, buddy. Okay, let's be off to go and ransack those ruins. 
as we're going here. The ruins are over that way. But I think we have some more pine trees here we can check for resin later on. That will be handy. What do we have here? Ooh, a seashell. I'm going to leave you alone, though. Hoo choo! Hoo hoo! Oh, that was a close one, buddy. That was a real close one. <laughs> oh. Oh, you think you're a clever pup. You very nearly were, though. So some of these ruins are going to have basements. And we can often find where those basements are by digging in and around these these bony soil blocks. These basements may hold some interesting things for us, so let's go see what we can find. Oh, here we go. Look at this. We have some kind of basement down here. Let's dig a little staircase down. What do we have? Oh, neat. Okay. Oh, very cool. So we have an aged wooden bed lets you sleep for up to nine and a half hours. We have a cracked vessel full of forage goods, two of them, and a loam planter. These are neat. These are just decorative planters, the same kind that we can make, except that they have neat designs on them. So we'll take this guy. And I did not bring anything to store a lot of junk in. So we're going to leave a whole bunch of junk behind. What's in you? We have forage. We have clay. Nothing terribly interesting. We got some nice bandages. We're going to, I think, dump the raw bush meat and we'll take this bed. Yeah, thank you. And this dirt. And sift through it for dead people's rings and such later. Oh, there's more up here. Oh. We have ore. And a, and a storage vessel. Oh, there we go. We can store some stuff in here. That's very good. Okay, and we have an ore vessel. What did we get ore-wise? We got some bismuthonite. Very cool. And let's chuck you here. Grab this. And we'll just stick on our back. So this one, we do not find a basement yet. And it might not have a basement. They don't all have basements, but I was hoping for a couple more. Oh, we have more buildings over that way. Okay. Let's see. I want to hit maybe right in here a little bit first. No. I guess not. Okay, let's check out these bigger ruins over here. Ooh, another cracked ore vessel. Oh, we got some coal from that first one, too. Hey, we got some copper. What a coincidence. This game knows us too well. Okay, we got some more bony soil. Let's get this up here. And we have some kind of subfloor. Maybe not. Oh, this is usually a good sign. <laughs> there we go. There it is, folks. We've hit money again. What do we got this time? Forage. Okay, not so, not so bad. Anything else in here? Looks like this may be a no. Let's keep looking this direction. Nope. Oh, there we go. Hey, another storage vessel. Nothing in it. Okay. Now, this isn't super valuable, but it does save a lot of time and clay making this thing. So we'll take it. 
What else have we got here? Oh. Oh, we have a mausoleum or something, looks like. Oh, this could be interesting. We have a f another forge vessel full of bamboo and grass and junk. And what do we have in the seed vessel? <gasps> Pumpkin seeds. Yes, I was hoping for something like this. So this is one of the seed types I mentioned in a previous episode that's, I guess, better in some ways than normal seeds. For one, pumpkin seeds are ignored by rabbits, so they won't bother them. And pumpkins grow a bit differently, and their produce, when used right, is actually sort of more nourishing per plot of land used. So it can be a more efficient crop to grow in some ways. And what are we looking at here? That could be a room, maybe. Ooh, I spy something. Yes, I spy a breach in the rock, and I spy some kind of room down here. Oh boy. What do we... Ooh, oh, this is some neat stuff. This is some neat stuff. We have a pile of junk, we have a second bed, and we have an aged torch holder. Now, these are really cool, because one, they hold torches. Neat, cool, awesome, great. What this doesn't say, just by looking at it, is that this torch will never go out. This is not a permanent light source, aside from the fact that I can remove a torch from it. But you can place this outside in the rain, it won't go out. You can place it inside and come back in a week after a long journey, and it'll still be lit. So we are definitely going to take this, once I figure out how to manage our inventory a little better. Let's break this and see what we get. Oh, ooh, we got metal parts, okay. Cool. Let's get this torch holder and this bed. And what have you got for us? Oh boy. Storage vessel. Oh, with more rusty gears. Oops. A cracked ore vessel. Some water, which we're going to get rid of. Okay, let's break this guy. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, great. Another secret room with another bed. And more, oops, my knees. And more good stuff. All right, what do we got in here? Okay, not bad. More forage. I'm always in the market for more reeds. Okay, and let's go ahead and we'll just plop these guys in here. And a bee need. <laughs> Okay. Very funny game. We do have more buildings to explore, but those might have to wait till tomorrow. Alright, lad. What do we have in here? Or, or, or. Looks like some coal. Okay. What can I ditch? You know what? Let's put this storage vessel down. We'll come back for you. We'll put you in this big one here with your other storage buddy. We'll grab this brown coal. And then we will dig out in here. Hey, there it is. What have we got back here? Might just be a forage vessel. And there's more. I'm also wondering how they built this thing. So we now have high rift activity. I think it's time for us to make a break back home because as you can see the days are getting shorter now. We have less and less daylight to work with and I don't want to be caught out here in the wild in a high rift activity night. Oh that boar just scared me. Hoo hoo. We are home safe and sound with a pretty good haul of loot. I'm going to get to organizing this in our storage areas, and then I will bring you back in the morning when those molds are finished firing. And good morning on this very loud, noisy day. All these drifters outside. I 
I think we need to clean these guys up before we can do anything about these molds. So, wish me luck. Okay. With that all done, and rifts all around us on this medium rift activity day, we can go ahead and pick up all of our molds. One by one, apparently. Okay, let's get these inside and let's learn about smelting. So, Smelting Adventure Story is a bit different from other block games, if there were other block games in the world, in that it tries to emulate the real world in how you do it. So, first of all, you need to have a fire pit and you need to have a crucible. The crucible is kind of like a soup pot, but for metals. Then, into the crucible, you need to put your nuggets of metal. Now, each ingot's worth is a hundred pieces of, or a hundred units of the metal. Each piece is worth five. So for every 20 nuggets you put in, you'll get one ingot out of it. And typically, you'll find that most tools, in fact, everything except for the anvil, which is over here, and the hell hammer, which is in this storage vessel over here, Everything also uses one ingot's worth of metal, or 100 units. So you're typically going to be working with those amounts of metals. Then, you need to get the metal to its melting temperature, or smelting temperature. In this case, 1084 degrees Celsius. And that can take a while. Now we have charcoal, but we picked up this brown coal. And since the brown coal is kind of less useful for other applications, I'm just going to go ahead and use that here. But to save on that, I'm also going to do some preheating, where I'm going to put some peat in here. And I'm going to preheat this until it hits 900 degrees. And from there, I'll put the brown coal in and let it heat up the rest of the way. And with the last piece of peat starting to burn, I'm going to go ahead and put in two pieces of brown coal. We might only need one, but I think I'll do two just to be safe. The smelting process will take longer based on how much metal you've put in here. And each crucible can hold just over 25 ingots worth of metals. So if I were to make, say, 2,000 units of copper ingots, I would need roughly not quite 10 times the amount of fuel. It's a little less linear than that, at least in my experience. Okay, we are at the copper's smelting temperature. And now that we are, you'll see the green arrow start to fill up. And just like with cooking, you can smelt with residual heat sometimes, but I find that the heat in these, because it's so different from the ambient temperature, it drops a lot faster, and therefore it's a bit riskier in that this temperature may also drop a lot faster. Now we should talk about our character for a moment. Our character is what's known as a seraph. Hello, so we have blue skin and everything. And seraphs have hands that are made not of skin, but asbestos. Because watch this. In just a moment, we'll have a molten copper filled crucible. And look at that. I can hold it in my hands, no problem. No tears, no burning, no fire, no sizzle of flesh. None of that. Asbestos hands. Anyway, once you have your crucible full of metal, you can crouch and hold right click to pour. And we're done. All we have to do now is wait. And since we're going to be waiting for those to cool for a little bit, why don't we go check out something else I found while I was searching for quartz the other day. The decision to pan for quartz was not an easy one to make because it takes forever. And prior to that, and the events leading up to it, were I was bouncing around the countryside looking for quartz bits on the ground, and I didn't find any. There are some up near our old home, but I wasn't interested in going that far. But while I was coming around this mountain here, I accidentally fell in this hole. And I stopped, and I said, hey, you know what, this isn't too steep of a hole. Let's take a quick peek inside. And what did I find but some pink cream marble? This is pretty cool. And I thought, hey, what luck? Why don't we press that luck and take a peek further in? And I didn't have to go far until 
presto, I found this little bit of treasure here. And I wanted to explore it with you guys. So I'm going to wall this off a bit to keep any potential drifters off our backs, because I haven't been down that way yet. I'm not real interested in finding out just yet what's lurking down there. And I'm going to go ahead and light this area up a bit, because drifters can spawn underground, even without rifts. There we go. And let's see what's in here. So we have a lot of granite stone bricks. We have aged wooden planks for the floors and the ceiling. Oh, and we have spooky music. And a second room that we have to duck to get into or just break this block. So in these kinds of ruins, you're going to find these heavily collapsed chests, some of which you can open, some of which you can't. You can't actually put items into them. You only take them out, and once you've taken all the items out, you can no longer open them. That one's empty. It's a slightly collapsed chest. So a lot of very empty chests here. And once you have removed all the items from them, normally they are just useless. You, you can break them, but you can't do anything else with them. However, we do have the carry capacity mod on, so we can actually carry these back to our house if we want to, and use them as like decorative storage, you know, in an attic where we have old things that are collapsing. So let's grab, I guess so here we go, some rusty gears out of here. Oh, we have a closed wooden crate. Oh, an old-fashioned crate, apparently. A closed aged crate. Nifty. Okay. Well, let's bust through this wall here and see what's on the other side. Ooh, we have some more cool stuff. All right, we have another collapsed chest. Anything in here? Nothing in you. We have a cracked forage vessel. Hey, with more cattails and more of these bandages. We have another crate, which we'll grab and we'll place as per the game's request that we do so. We have a farming vessel full of more cattails. And we have some aged wooden tables. That's pretty cool. These should make some neat decorations for our house. And I'm going to guess that there might be something through this ceiling if we were to break it down. Or maybe the floor. So I'm going to hack away at a few of these and see if we find anything. Oh, there we go. Jackpot. Let's drop a ladder. Oh, cool stuff. Cool, cool stuff. Oh, this is so neat. And a free vessel for carrying things home and once our inventory is too full. So let's see, nothing in there. We have uh, medium chunks of sphalerite, cool. We have some lime. We have a lead ingot. Okay. Very cool. I think we'll go ahead and put some of these. Oh, nice. We have a loam storage vessel. Oh, cool. And we have a dirt floor. I wonder if that means there's more beneath us. Let's find out. guess not. Well, I think I'm going to mark this for later perusal because these granite stone bricks will be a time saver and these ruins are the only places you can get these aged wooden planks which you can then, once we have better tools, we can saw down into uh, more usable materials. Let's head home because it's getting late and we're also going to have some cooled tool heads to work with. Okay, we are home, safe and sound again. I've got the loam storage vessel down here and our home is getting a little cluttered. But let's take a look at these tool heads. 
As you can see, they now say that they are both cold, so we can pick them up. And just like with any stone tools, we can take a pair of sticks, and we can slap the copper pickaxe head there, and the copper hammer head there, and we have the two tools that we need to further advance ourselves into the Copper Age, which we will do in the morning because it is dark out and the night is full of drifters. Well, everyone, it is morning. It's still noisy around here, but let's get to it. As you may recall, as we have been exploring these fields, I've been marking all of the copper deposits we've come across. It is now time to go ransack those. Let's get to it. I have a copper deposit pinned on my map at the top of the screen there. You can see it right up here. And we're just going to make a mad dash away from all the drifters. Still medium rift activity, but that's okay. Because the sun is out, we're not going to get any drifters. Unless they follow us. And we are coming up on our first deposit right here. Here we go. If you'll recall, I said a little while ago, if you see copper bits, that means that directly beneath these blocks, there are guaranteed to be some copper ore blocks. And generally, that means you're going to have a larger disk of copper having generated here. Now, ores in Vintage Story, they generate in disks. However, due to geological upheaval, they can be sort of stretched vertically. So if you are mining in a mountain, especially near any slopes, your ore disk may be more of an ore umbrella, or maybe an ore ellipse. But right here is pretty flat ground. So we're going to dig straight down. We'll find this disk. And if we dig in this direction, we may actually need to go up a block. And if we dig too far in this direction and the disk is rather large, we may have to go down a block. But these are kind of close together, so I don't think that's going to be necessary. So let's get digging. OK. And we've hit rock already. I'm going to get some torches. And I'm going to get some ladders. I don't need the hammer. And torch at the ready. OK. And we're just going to keep digging straight down. And like that already, we have our first block of native copper ore. Now, each ore has a different quality from low to, I think, bountiful, or poor to bountiful. This is medium, so we're going to get a decent amount of copper, but nothing to write home about. And here we go. Here is the disc of ore that I was talking about. It seems like we might be on the edge of it. If you're on the edges, you may find sort of a ragged distribution of ore blocks. And then once you get toward the center of it, it'll sort of become more apparent just how disc-like it is. Although this is a very tiny disc. Is that it? I think it might be. Okay, that was a very tiny uh, ore disc. So let's head back up. I'm actually going to replace this dirt here. And we'll take our ladders with us because we'll reuse those. And now that we have the ore from here, I want to go ahead and pick up these copper bits so that if I come back this way again, I won't mistakenly believe that there's any more ore down here. There we go, and I'm going to mark this off the map. And I might actually just make this black so that we know not to look in this area for more ore. Let's go to the next copper ore deposit. This one here. And we'll try again for more. And here we are. This one's kind of on a hill, so if this one is of at least decent size, we will need to sort of dig down to the east and west in order to follow the contours of the land. Oh, and it's right there. Awesome.
And unlike in other block games, mining from a ladder does not slow you down in terms of mining speed. So it is perfectly safe to dig straight down, hang out on a ladder, and dig beneath you. Well, here we go. This one is two blocks thick. And we have poor copper. But copper is copper. This is a decent sized one. Let's dig this out. Breakfast break. Back to work. And there we have it mined out. Now this disc was kind of a funny bowl shape. So I'm not real convinced that there's going to be any if we dig this way, but let's find out anyway. Yeah, I had a feeling this wouldn't find anything else. But that made it easy to get it all. And back up we go. So. I think you get the idea of what's going on here, and how to mine for ore, at least surface ore. There is deeper ore, but we don't have really the tools we need to go find that yet. And unlike certain other block games, if block games existed, you can't just dig down and expect to find ore distributed evenly within each chunk of the world. Ore spawns in a much more spread out manner, with in some cases, many kilometers between areas where you're going to find any given type of ore. So I'm going to go and clear out uh, at least this copper deposit here and maybe a couple others so we didn't get a whole ton. And then I'll meet you back at our house and we'll talk about what we've dug up. So I don't know if you can hear them, but I am hearing drifter voices somewhere nearby. Now that means that there's probably a cave around here somewhere. So I might actually dig out a little bit, see if I can find it. And I'm not going to explore it today unless we find a ruin. Because we have no armor, and our weapons are still pretty trashed here. But I think it's over in this direction somewhere. I hear them splashing, too. Oh. Do you hear that scary music? That means that our sanity, our temporal stability, has dropped below, I think, about 60... 65% or 64%. And we're not in danger at the moment, but we will be if we stick around too much longer. Ooh. There they are. What do we have down here? Some kind of cave with a whole bunch of drifters in it. Okay. Well, we will leave that for later, and we'll come back. Now that we're home, let's take a look at what we've got. So we found 11 nuggets of native copper, the same kind of ones that we got from panning and from picking up off the ground, and I think some loot vessels. We got a stack and a half of poor chunks of native copper. Now each of these is 15 units of copper, so it's worth three of these nuggets. We then got seven medium chunks of native copper, and this is 20 units each, so four nuggets worth. And then we got a poor crystallized chunk of native copper. These are kind of rare drops from ores, and as a hunter I'm going to see these even less than many other classes would. These have 30 units of copper, so six pieces of native copper. However, because of their rarity, I often like to just save these. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in our loam vessel over here. And we will maybe put that on display somewhere later. Now, for smelting the copper, we can't just put these into the crucible. I'll show you. Crucible goes in. We can't do anything with these here. They won't go in. Because we first have to break them with a hammer in our crafting grid. So, just take your hammer, put it over the copper ore, and click away. And there we have it. And we're going to go ahead and mash up all of this copper. There we go. We're going to see how many units we can make. We can make 16 and a half ingots worth of copper. I'm going to pull it out to just 16, and we're going to take a look at how many molds we have and figure out from there just how many pieces of this copper we actually want to smelt right now. 
So these are all of the molds that I actually care about right now. We have the hammer, we have two pickaxe heads, we have the shovel, we have the axe, and we have the prospecting pick. Now we also have a long blade mold, but one, we already have two of them, and two, we are a hunter, so we actually deal a lot less damage with melee weapons. So I'm not sure I even want a long blade until we can get to the higher tier long blades when they might help offset our piddly damage. We also have this Hellhammer mold and six ingot molds. This one we don't need right now, we're going to come back to that much later. And ingots we need an anvil for, which we have a mold for right here. And because we have so many ingots worth of copper in here, I think it's going to be wise to fill up this anvil. And with 900 units going into the anvil, 600 for all of these molds, we will have 100 left over so we can put down one ingot mold and we'll have one ingot to do something with later. And in fact, you know what? I might take up this guy and just make one pickaxe and make a second ingot. There we go. So let's get heating all this copper up. This will actually take a little while because as I said before, there is some emulation of thermal mass in Vintage Story, so the more copper you're heating up, the longer it will take. And in goes the brown coal. And you can see, now that we're doing 16 ingots worth of copper, just how slow that green arrow is creeping across the screen there. So this will probably take until 2 or 3 in the morning at the earliest, I think. And my prediction was right. It is 2.30, and we are just about done with this. Hopefully these last bits of flame and the last second to last piece of brown coal will round this out. There we go. Everybody put your hands together for asbestos hands. I'm going to go ahead and fill this anvil first. This is kind of the biggest beast. This one can take a while. And there it comes. Alright. And then let's fill the rest of these. What a sight. Glowing molten metal. And our feet are asbestos too. And our clothes. Well, everyone. With our new tool heads and ingots and anvil cooling all around us, I think that's going to be about it for this episode. We've done a lot today. We've made some big steps forward and upward in the world. And next time, we're going to talk about what to do with some of these new tools we have, as well as the anvil. Anyway, my name has been Kurazar. I would like to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.